Welcome to Creative Spaces. We're talking to people about their careers and how they got started and their surrounding environment. This is Kevin Booth and Rob Wenner, and in today's episode of the Creative Spaces podcast, we're talking to Grammy-winning producer, mixer, songwriter, and multi-instrumentalist Greg Wells. I have to feel like I'm not being lied to by my speakers, by the room that I'm in, and I didn't know about this stuff when I started producing records, and my first uh, few attempts at having a studio weren't treated, you know, I just put up speakers and just kind of went for it. And it really bit me in the butt, you know? I uh, would play mixes in the car. We've all had that experience where you like, wherever you're mixing something and then you go listen to it somewhere else and you think, why does it sound like that? That's not what it sounded like before. Originally from Ontario, Canada, Greg's musical journey started at an early age. After moving to Los Angeles in 1990, he studied with famed jazz composer, pianist, and string arranger, Claire Fisher. Greg's wide range of skills have crafted hits for Adele, John Legend, Taylor Swift, Dua Lipa, 21 Pilots, Pink, Keith Urban, Deftones, Katy Perry, Carrie Underwood, One Republic, and the soundtrack of The Greatest Showman, just to name a few. As a multi-instrumentalist, he has the ability to artfully mold his projects and productions with incredible precision, craftsmanship, and taste. And he's mastered the balance between hands-on guidance and drawing out an artist's sound regardless of genre. Greg has developed several acclaimed pieces of music software, including a signature series of four plugins with Waves. We are honored to have Greg join us today from his personal studio in Los Angeles, California. Greg, thank you for joining us today. Hi guys, thank you. What a wow! Who is this amazing person you're describing? It's definitely know, not right? me. All <laughs> right, in the rear view, that's pretty incredible, right? Yeah, that's not who I wake up feeling like. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's awesome. I'm not sure you're you the right guy on yeah. right now. You're Maybe that could him. be like the alarm on the phone, you know, just to remind your wife and and family <laughs> just who woke up a today of you saying that whole intro yeah. yes yeah i should wake up to that every day now can i have my first cup of coffee right <laughs> so, what what drew you to music initially i was just obsessed with it from like from the earliest age we uh unfortunately i'm so old that my babysitters are now a lot some of them are, are dead but uh we i had this amazing babysitter when i was a little baby and um, uh, she was a drummer. Wow. And she went on to become a percussionist in a Canadian, uh, I'm from Canada. She was a, a percussionist in, in a, the Hamilton uh, Symphony Orchestra, I think they call it, whatever mm-hmm. the symphony, the orchestra is in the city of Hamilton in Ontario, Canada. And she taught high school as well. And she, you know, she was like a serious musician and in particular, mm-hmm. a drummer and a percussionist. Wow. And she swore up and down. I can't corroborate this because I don't remember, but she swore when she was babysitting me when I was, this is again, according to her, and she's no longer alive, so we really can't corroborate it. But yeah. <laughs> um, she said when I was six months old, I was uh, a drumming um, grooves, like actual grooves on the side of my crib. Wow. And she said it was bizarre and she'd never seen anything like it. Now, wow. maybe it wasn't six months, maybe it was nine months, maybe it was 13 months. I don't know. Still. But that's the story. And, <laughs> uh, it, it, you know, I, I mean, I have, I have six kids of my own now and I've seen sort of similar things happen with a lot of them. You know, I was a little boy in the 1970s. So that's, that's, that's not, it's not pre-electricity, but it's definitely like pre-internet, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's yeah. pre it's pre yeah. 5 million channels on television. Mm-hmm. I mean, right. I remember at one right. point we only had three channels. Yep. Three. I remember that one. Went to, then I remember it went okay. to 12. And then I remember we got this weird like cable box with a long wire to the TV. And then we got like 40 channels, I think. No streaming music. You may be a top 40 countdown on radio. I would record <laughs> the top 40 countdown on a little cassette player, you know, and then like listen back to it. And 
Yeah. Um, lots of recording stuff off the radio. But I, my, where I'm going with all this is I was so bored as a kid. I was so bored. And I was uh, in a um, growing up in a town of about 60,000 people that was really all about uh, sports mm -hmm. and pretty conservative generally. There was like a small faction of people who were real art lovers, but like they weren't friends of my family. And I didn't meet them till I was about to move away from that town as, a, as an older mm -hmm. teenager. Right. So it was mostly like kind of not really great country music or like sort of Christian folk music. My dad was a pastor and uh, there was a lot of music in the church, but I didn't resonate with a lot of it. And so I just see little snippets of like, you know, James Brown on TV mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. on like I would watch Soul Train out of Detroit yep. every Saturday. Yep. And I had no idea where Detroit was or what that was or, or <laughs> that those were mostly black people and that I wasn't like I didn't have that thought at all. I right. just thought whatever the hell that is. I want to be doing, yeah. I want to be on that show. I want to be yeah. a dancer on that show at the age of like five, you know, watching yeah. this every Saturday afternoon. It really just rocked my world. I loved it. I mean, I it was incredible. Talking yeah, about I it. Wow. did a very similar thing. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, so, I'm sure it's, a, it's, I'm sure it's a common story. Yeah. So I wonder, is there any musicians then that you modeled yourself after or that you grabbed a hold of first besides James Brown or? Uh, Jackson 5. You know, five years old in the early 70s, the Jackson 5 was kind of all over TV and yeah. they were on fire. And, you know, Michael was just like, I mean, there's never been anyone that can kind of just right. even dance like Michael. Forget right. the singing and just the energy and everything. And I, that was another big one. It was just like, whatever that is. And then Jesus Christ Superstar. When I was three and a half years old, I saw my mom took me to see a matinee show of that in the theater, which is a pretty intense thing to show a three-year-old. Yeah, really. I'm not sure if she realized what she was getting into. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, Judas, like, Judas hangs himself from a tree, and uh, Israeli tanks are chasing him right before he hangs himself. But, but the music and the dancing and the energy of it really blew my lights out. And, and I was too young to really understand the religious connotation of what was happening. I just thought, holy crap, like, that's... You know, I hear about veterinarians um, talking about when they were kids that some of them got bit by an animal, mm -hmm. you know, quite commonly bit by a dog, and then they wind up becoming a, an animal doctor. Right. Jesus Christ Superstar was the, absolutely the dog bite for me. Wow. Um, That's interesting. Wow. I just listened to that over and over and over and over and over again every day for years. Yeah. Unfortunately, the movie didn't date very well. It was very much <laughs> of its time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. I, went, mm -hmm. I went to this... Um, but it really changed my life. So, of course, I hold it in hugely high reverence. And I went to this um, showing of it about 10 years ago here in Los Angeles where it had been, I don't know if remastered is the right word, but it, you know, it kind of been like made to look new again. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. it looked amazing. It looked like a brand new film and the music sounded great. And I was sitting next to some younger, I don't know if they were teenagers or maybe like in their early 20s. And this poor girl was sitting right beside me. The theater is pretty packed. You know, watching it through her eyes it's funny it's like an snl skit it's like something yeah. on the website funny or die <laughs> a lot of it you know it's just it's so earnest it's so mm -hmm. earnest and yes. it's just so hilariously dated um mm -hmm. they, they were laughing throughout the entire movie and, and it started to really bother me and at one point like i became the grumpy old man and i actually turned yeah. her and i'm canadian and i just i don't do stuff like this right but i turned her and i'm like can you just stop laughing and then she was like and I, of course, felt like a total idiot for the rest of the film. But I, you know, yeah, it's not. It it it, it didn't date well. But holy right. moly, it's, wow. it's why I'm talking to you guys right now. Wow, yeah. that's awesome. That's uh, awesome. What instrument did you play first? Was it drums? Uh, we um, didn't have money for drums, right? And uh, we didn't have money for any instruments. So I played the furniture. Wow, mm -hmm. I know. That. And I knew what every uh, seat cushion. Yep. Uh, armrest. I knew what they all sounded like, pots and pans. And somebody actually gave me a snare drum, someone at my dad's church. And uh, it was used and I was so ecstatic to have it. It was like I'd been given a lightsaber or something, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. I beat it into submission and within a couple of months, the head, w you know, was like, like that. <laughs> and yeah. in our total ignorance, we thought I'd broken the drum. Right. Right. Yeah. We had no idea you could buy a new drum head. Yeah. So we, we never did. <laughs> oh, we just no. Had no clue. Oh, no. Right. So I put, I put a towel over it, tried to tighten the towel as much as I could. <laughs> and I played that for another couple of years. And we had an upright piano that my mom had bought before I was born. Um, she was a used upright piano. Uh, she still has it. I actually really love it. It's really loud and really bright sounding. 
So I would, that was my first drum set, really, okay. that and the furniture. Yeah. And I just started like, you know, there's all these photos of me as a little one-year-old, two-year-old kind of reaching up and playing a plink away. And then I kind of took to it, you know, I mean, piano mm-hmm. is, is, is a percussion instrument. So I started banging on that. And then that led to my grandmother and my mom kind of showing me a bit about how to read some simple music. And when I was seven, uh, we very luckily found a really great piano teacher in my little hometown named Marjorie mm-hmm. Engels, who also recently passed away. Mm-hmm. Um, and she did half the lesson as classical music and then half the lesson as boogie woogie because I think she recognized I was really a, f- a frustrated drummer. Wow. Mm-hmm. And that got me on a, on a path that I stayed on for years and years and years. Very cool. Did your school system have a music program at all? Were you able? Were you involved in that at all? Um, they did. It was terrible. Really? It was really bad. I started getting into music beyond piano lessons when I was about four. 15. And then I started meeting some older musicians in, in my town, Peterborough, and they invited me to, to play with them, like in the clubs. And cool. uh, so I was underage playing with these, you know, pretty interesting uh, bands that they'd put together. And that kind of blew my lights out in another way and mm-hmm. opened my ears to everything from Joni right. Mitchell to Talking Heads to Motown to wow. all the stuff that I wasn't hearing at home. I didn't have an older sibling to turn me on to, to cool music. And my mm-hmm. my parents' taste was not their generation it was really of their parents generation Mm -hmm. so there's a lot of like kind of light show tunes and light classical music all played it on volume one with people talking over it it was never like an (laughs) appreciation of cool music right right. right. that was all kind of found through tv and through these great older musicians that uh took me under their wing awesome wow awesome that's right so that's around the time you start to figure out what you're going to do with the rest of your life was that that, was there a moment where that clicked and you said this is what i'm going to do i'm going to do music or did you have some kind of other plan or fallback plan you know my mom wanted me to be an english teacher and do piano lessons on the side and i had this thing happen to me when i was 11 i got this disease in my right hip it's called leg perthase disease it's not super rare but it's not very common Uh, usually kids from infancy to about three years old, that's when you get it, if you're going to get it. I got it at 11. Wow. And it cuts off the blood flow to the top of your leg bone, which is your hip ball, right? Mm -hmm. That's the top of your femur. And so my left hip is totally fine, still fine, but my right hip kind of stopped growing and it changed shape and and it started to slide out of the hip socket. Wow. Which was super painful. So I was in a wheelchair off and on for two years and i had mm-hmm. to i was in casts from like the top of my legs down to my ankles both legs wow with a stick there's actually a hockey stick plastered between the two oh, wow. legs <laughs> oh, um, for uh for a long time i had to learn how to walk again and that really slowed me down and so i was just in bed like for months and it was then then the boredom just like ratcheted up to a whole other level of you know catastrophic boredom but i mm-hmm. we had a little radio and i had uh this little one earpiece like a wired Mm -hmm. earpiece out of this AM radio. And I just started listening all the time to the local AM radio station. And, and so as a result, I'm like hyper familiar with songs that were on the radio during those two years, Mm -hmm. you know, like Michael McDonald, what a fool believes. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And some of it was just absolutely amazing music. And it got me thinking about, you know, maybe music is like a thing that I could just I don't know how you do it. Like no one around me is doing music and it's Mm -hmm. definitely not being modeled for me, but Mm -hmm. maybe there's a way. And then when we got that cable box where we got 40 or 50 channels, we started getting a a really badass TV station out of Toronto, which is like the New York of Canada. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's this, there's, it's it's still there. It's a TV station called City TV. Yeah, I remember. And it's owned and run creatively by this pretty amazing guy named Moses Zneimer. And he would put up the most incredible programming. Like he, you know, if a concert came to town, he would negotiate the live telecast rights and he'd just set up three cameras and put it live on the air from BB King to wow. I remember when Stevie Stevie Ray Vaughan played the Elma Combo Club in Toronto. It was like unbelievable. And I saw that live when wow. it went to air. Very they cool. had a show that was on every Friday night called The New Music, and it was an hour show every 15 minutes. It was probably 14 minutes with ads, but every, like, you know, if there was four quarters to it, every quarter they would profile anyone making music, like anyone professionally making music. So it would be like the first 50 minutes could be, I remember seeing U2 on their first tour of Canada and they all looked wow. like they were just fresh out of high school. They probably were. <laughs> they were interviewed and like really great candid interviews just in a diner. And then the next 15 minutes would be 
you know, Laurie Anderson, like a performance artist out of New York. The wow. next 15 minutes would be Pat Metheny. The next 15 minutes would be, I don't know, you know, and it's, it's all over. The, whoever was coming through Toronto, yeah. um, they would arrange an interview. And that's when I was really like, oh, there are people doing this for a living. I don't know how they're doing it, but mm -hmm. there's proof, you know, there's proof that A, the feelings that I'm feeling aren't crazy. And maybe there's a way if I can. Yeah. And then there was a show, a Canadian kids show. I don't remember the name of it. And they were interviewing Steve Lukather and David Page from the band Toto. And at the end of the interview, this woman asked the guy, she said, do you have any advice for young musicians out there that might want to go into music? Of course, I sat up yeah. straight. And Steve Lukather gave the best answer. He's like, yeah, it's really simple. You figure out the records that you love. You read the credits. You figure out where those records are being made, who's making those records, and then you move to that city and try to get to know those people. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I've never, I mean, I can still see him saying that, yep. you know, mm -hmm. and this would have been like the early 80s, I guess. Yeah. But that was, that was the best professional advice I think I'd ever heard, and that's, that is what I wound up doing. Yeah. It worked out well. It took a long time, but it, it, he was right. You've worked with an amazing group of group of artists and you're very comfortable with different styles it seems how do you approach that do you do you just like the, a lot of styles of music yeah i do like i like a lot of different type kinds of food you know mm -hmm. um i like a lot of different kinds of people i like a lot of different kinds of movies um uh so musically i am i figured out that i'm really drawn to stuff that i don't understand hmm. and that's i think that was cultivated by everything i've just described you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. kind of living in a cultural vacuum yeah so instead of you saying i don't like this and put it away like most people do you're like i don't like this why don't i like this or why is that i don't understand it and you dig deeper not yes not every time but um but a lot of the time yeah and and you know or if there's like it's just a thread of like something really interesting in it i would want to know more about it i kind of want to decode like you know what are the people thinking what inspired them to do that and i mean like any kind of music mm -hmm. from like you know i have a record of like school kids in tanzania singing just local songs and a lot of it's clapping songs and it's really amazing and um that so i don't even know how i discovered that record to like this the for me the weirder and more exotic it was the more interesting it was mm -hmm. most of the time i think because it felt like manna from heaven you right. know right it developed this really insatiable curiosity about uh, uh how people create art you know, mm -hmm. of course, uh, you play jazz and arrange jazz, so your knowledge of music is is extreme. You have very good knowledge of of music and music theory and understanding. Music theory was no fun to study when I was a teenager because I just wanted to play and, <laughs> and experience, you know, music in real time. Mm -hmm. And I remember actually stopping my music theory teacher my first year of music college and saying to him in the hallway, like, "Why do we have to like?" Why do we have to analyze the carpet when we already know how to walk and run on it? Like, why, wow. why, why are we doing this? You know? <laughs> and he, he gave me an answer. He's like, basically, he said, you're kind of too young to understand why. It's good to know this stuff. Yeah. Um, and, and having said that, <clears throat> I did a lot of classical music theory before I went to jazz college. Like, really, like, analyzing Bach fugues, you know, like, way, way down the rabbit hole. Like, um, and I knew all the Latin names for it, and I've forgotten a lot of it now. But that stuff's in my bone marrow, and mm -hmm. I didn't enjoy studying it at the time. Right. Mm -hmm. Kind of fascinating to analyze the box stuff, but but it was boring, you know, and I kind of trudged through it because I was doing classical piano exams. Mm -hmm. So in Canada, there's a system, it's called like, it's kind of like the Juilliard School of Music in Canada. It's called the Royal Conservatory of Music. Mm -hmm. It's this big, gorgeous, musty-smelling building in Toronto on Bloor Street. And I used to take the bus from my hometown, take a two-hour bus ride and go study there throughout my teens on the weekends, on Saturdays. And they have a, a grade system where you can like do an exam and you get your grade three piano. They don't say third grade in Canada, it's like grade and then the number. And then you get your grade eight. And if you get your grade eight, then that means you're kind of serious. And then grade 10 is the highest number. When you get to the higher numbers, you can't just learn the pieces. You have to actually learn the history of the composers and you have to learn the commensurate level of music theory that goes with that and by the time you get to grade 10 the theory is like it was intense it was like analyzing you know four or five part Bach fugues and, yeah. and being able to really do it so 
I liked playing the pieces. I didn't like studying it, but I'm so thankful that that <laughs> stuff is is in me somewhere because it's, it's just really, part of your vocabulary. It is. It's in a. It's like studying architecture. It's exactly like studying architecture mm-hmm. and what makes a building uh, not fall over. What makes a building sing and resonate and um, it's musical architecture and and absolutely it's been a huge a huge influence on on what I do and and how I I you know I see things in shapes a lot of times musically. Um, it's hard to define how it's been helpful, but I definitely know it has been really helpful. You seem to have a really complementary relationship between the technical side and the creative and the and the musical side. Is that true? It is now. The technical side came late to me, and I wasn't interested in it until I saw people doing it really well. So I was just sort of like a monkey jumping from instrument to instrument. In high school, I taught myself guitar and bass. And on those bus trips to Toronto, I, I would cram in around my piano lessons uh, some lessons on orchestral percussion like Mm -hmm. studying how to really play timpani how to really play like four mallet marimba or xylophone and how to to learn exactly how to hit the orchestral bells like the chimes the tubular bells all that stuff um also studied pipe organ for a while as a teenager uh which is a whole other thing your feet become the left hand that's incredible your left hand becomes another right hand (laughs) it's bizarre rewiring but so I was really just music, 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 playing music, playing music. Never wrote anything. Just wanted to play. Hmm. Never slowed down enough to think, well, maybe I should compose something. And I tried a few times and never really liked what I was composing. So I just was having so much fun playing in orchestras or punk bands or jazz trios or whatever was available, whoever would have me. And mm-hmm. then when I came to L.A. and I was studying with Claire Fisher, as you mentioned in the intro, the amazing Claire Fisher. Amazing. I was also studying with Terry Trotter, who oh. is an unbelievable L.A. jazz yeah, pianist. Absolutely. Um, who has played with Larry Carlton, the amazing guitar player for years. He was Larry's. He was in Larry's band as the keyboard player, piano player. Mm-hmm. Uh, toured with Frank Sinatra on Sinatra's last tour. He was Frank's piano player. He's just you know incredible, lovely man. So the two of them, and Claire and Terry, were friends. And they started recommending me for uh, studio work as a piano player. And I didn't know that was going to happen. And that is really the thing that kept me in Los Angeles. And that was 31 years ago. Wow. But I started meeting, after a few years of doing that, I started meeting engineers, recording engineers that I had heard of because I was following Steve Lukather's advice and reading the liner notes voraciously. And so when I was in the studio with somebody like that, I would just pummel them with questions. You know, how did you get that sound on this this mix of this song that I really love, how, how what were you, you know, what, what were you using? How'd you do it? And then they would show me because they love sharing this stuff most of the time. Mm-hmm. They most people aren't interested at all, but I think they're happy to share it when you have an interested audience. Mm-hmm. And and so I really soaked it in. And yeah. um, and then I had the good fortune to be able to hire uh, multiple Grammy winning engineer and producer Joe Ciccarelli several times in the two uh, thousands. And on uh, one of those. Uh, records, we spent half a year together on a record. So I was in the studio with him for six months watching him get the best drum sounds I'd ever heard, the best vocal sounds, the best guitar, best piano, best everything sounds I had ever seen anyone get in front of me. And of course, I was every day, you know, questions, questions, questions. Mm-hmm. And, and I would watch him, I'd watch everything that he did. And we would talk about it and talk about the gear and talk about his experiences. And I, I really hold him in the highest, highest regard. And that, of course, was a huge influence on me. And I couldn't afford, at the time, a lot of the gear that he was using, Mm -hmm. which is gear that he'd collected throughout his career. And just slowly started, you know, buying, like, knockoff versions of that gear. And then every once in a while, a a check would come in and I could afford the real version of Mm -hmm. something. And just slowly kind of, you know, accumulating stuff that I'd watched him and others use in studios. And tune your ears on how to use it effectively or musically. Yes, the ear tuning, I think, was the thing that took the longest for me. I wasn't a natural with it. I knew it when I heard it done right. I knew, like, that was amazing. But I really didn't have a natural talent for getting that right with the gear I had in front of me. My mixes were just terrible for years and years and years and years and years. You know, my kids are the opposite. My kids, my 18-year-old, a couple years ago, I gave him a little laptop and set him up. Uh, with Logic, and within four days, 
four days, he was playing me mixes of <laughs> things that he'd created from scratch. And he was playing a lot of it. It wasn't just loops and right, right. recorded things. Awesome. Although there were some of that, but a lot of it was him. And he was singing and like writing songs. And he played me this thing and it sounded like a mix. It sounded like someone who mixes records had mixed it. And I just looked at him like, how do you know how to do that? And he's like, I don't. I'm just, he had a natural <laughs> ability for it. Right. Yeah. Um, and maybe he, you know, peripherally soaked things up growing yeah. up around me. Yeah. Right. But I hadn't really shown him how to use that stuff. But yeah, I kept banging my head on a brick wall for a long time with the technical end of it. But I was so fascinated with it. You know, just like watching a great photographer, like watching them change lenses and what kind of film are you using? Mm -hmm. And are you even using film? And what's the lighting? And what's the aperture? And what's the all the different settings, the ISO, you know, mm -hmm. going from like knowing nothing about that stuff and not even caring to really caring about every bit of minutia. And, and then seeing the results in the final photograph, like, oh, shit, uh, well, that's why my pictures don't look like that. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Well, you know, when, let's say early 2000s, when it became affordable and doable to record at home and, and recording studios were, were being constructed in homes and basements all over, and Orlex is a part of that too, and, and we all saw that happening. And there's content produced and instructional things produced that we all watched, but I feel like what, what you're doing, and say Andrew Sheps and Sylvia Massey, Joe Barassi, Vance Powell, Joe Ciccarelli through Mix with the Masters or Pure Mix or for Universal Audio or for any of the content that you can find widely available now. It just seems like what you bring is really valuable and honest and everybody is bringing really good content and production techniques that I think stands apart from what was available years ago. And Is there a intention to do that? Oh, yeah. The intention is to, to make it for the young me anything including this podcast mm -hmm. anything that i do i'm like trying to be on that show the new music mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. i used to watch as a young teenager i'm like trying to you know i'm trying to be the guy as best i can that i wish that i could have had come visit my school or be, show up on tv or show up on you know the internet which didn't exist when i was a kid but yeah it's like it's really fun to pass that stuff on and mm -hmm. to share you know, these hard won sort of battle stories. I really enjoy it. <clears throat> the first time I was asked to do it, I was visiting my college in Toronto, Humber College. The professor that asked me to come, he's like, you're going to be great. And I said, I'm so nervous. Like, I've never done this before. And they made a video of it. And at some point I, I watched it back and I was surprised at two things that I didn't look nervous. I have this weird thing where when I'm super, super, super nervous, I actually look really calm. I don't know why. I don't feel that way inside. <laughs> but I look like I'm actually quite chilled yeah. out and everything's cool. Even yeah. though it feels like the end of 2001 where like <laughs> the space is just flying past me. Right. The speed of light. Um, but also I was surprised that I had a kind of an aptitude for it. You know, mm -hmm. I wasn't just flailing. And there were moments where I was like, oh, I wish that hadn't happened. But it was mm -hmm. mostly like, you know, there's like, there's an educator in me somewhere. Maybe it's my dad being a minister, being a preacher. Right. That exactly. that's kind of showing up in me somehow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Also, you know, I don't know if it's because the winters were long where I was from in Canada and, you know, we're all breathing this like forced heated air and no one was really aware of like, you know, trying to clean the air up or anything. But I was sick a lot as a kid too. So I was wow. home from school a lot, sick, having trouble breathing and just to fevers. And, and so a lot of like, you know, not just bored, but like lying in bed sick, bored, wow. with nothing to do. And, and I just started imagining like, you know, drum sounds and just like being really creative and thinking like, well, here's what I think drum sounds are going to sound like in five years. I had no idea what I was talking about, but it was just like a feeling, you know? Mm -hmm. And then later as a, as a teenager, when I kind of had like its crappy used electric guitar that I bought with money from playing church organ, I would just plunk, plunk around on that and come up with ideas in my head and jam to records. I put on any record that I you know, had on vinyl and uh, play along to it and just felt like this is really fun. I don't know how you turn this into a career. And then when I started years later, when I started actually playing on records in real recording studios. I remember thinking my first few sessions, this something's wrong here. I feel like I'm cheating because this feels exactly like when I used to jam to records in my bedroom. <laughs> it's that same feeling of just like really? playing, wow. like literally playing, yeah. you know, like when kids play, they know they're playing, but they're serious about it too. It's not mm -hmm. a joke, mm -hmm. but they're playing, mm -hmm. but they're serious. And it, so musically, that was what it felt like playing along to anything from a Kiss record to just and whatever record I was playing, David Bowie, anything. 
And I had the same feeling like on a, on a session thinking like, why does it feel like that? That I, it shouldn't feel like I'm in my bedroom. Hmm. I should feel right. like I'm in the celestial city in the wizard of Oz or something. And, <laughs> but it was the same thing where I'm going with this is that all yeah. of that boredom and all of that kind of imagination, just having no idea if any of it was tethered to any kind of tangible reality, mm -hmm. all of that was the best practice for what I do now for a living every day. And you were thinking I should be intimidated by this experience, but I feel completely at home. Yes. It was a weird push and pull of that. Yeah. That's exact. That's, that's said better than I could ever say it. I, cause it was intimidating. You know, there were yeah. people like Lee Sklar in the room, like <laughs> who I knew exactly who he was and, you know, Michael Landau and guitar, like, <laughs> you know, super famous people to me that loomed large as musicians. And I just couldn't relax. But when I just got in that sort of like bedroom vibe of like I'm jamming to a record, then I was fine. Mm -hmm. But wow. then I would, you know, my kind of like neurotic side would perk up and go, wait a minute, this, you know, exactly <laughs> yeah. what you just said. That's great. I think we all want to live your life now. That sounds great. I'm careful. Careful yeah. what you wish. For. Yeah. <laughs> so trans let's transition over to your studio and your personal uh, workspace. And just, we'll talk about acoustics, but we'll talk about the creative space in the room. Um, and how important that is, whether it's the physics of the acoustics of the room, the gear, the space, how it feels, how it smells, how it inspires you or doesn't. And, and what's your take on that? Well, you said the key word inspires and not just inspiration in terms of uh, inspiration, mm -hmm. but inspiring confidence is a huge one because trust is the key ingredient in making any kind of recorded music. If the people involved don't trust each other, <laughs> Yeah. You can't get the boat away from the dock. You're not going to go anywhere. Right. Uh, the canoe will tip immediately. You know, yeah. you ha it has to uh, be some kind of trust fall. And hopefully it's like a well-researched, well-educated risk of a trust fall. But it is a bit of a trust fall. Uh, even if you're working by yourself, you know, you'd never really know how something's going to sound in 30 minutes from now when you keep working on it. So mm -hmm. I have to feel like I'm not being lied to by my speakers, by the room that I'm in. And I didn't know about this stuff when I started producing records. And I, my first uh, few attempts at having a studio weren't treated, you know, I just put up speakers and just kind of went for it. And it really bit me in the butt, you know? I uh, would play mixes in the car. We've all had that experience where you like, you, wherever you're mixing something and then you go listen to it somewhere else and you think, why does it sound like that? That's not what it sounded like before. You know, now where I'm at the point where I do have 6 million children and I, you know, there's a lot of people who I'm keeping the lights on for, and, you know, occasionally like I'm overpaid for what I do. And then there'll be eight months to go by where I, like no money comes in or hardly any money comes in or the phone stops ringing for half a year. I don't know why. And then rings again. And, you know, or what happens to me a lot is, um, I know we're not talking about money, but I think it's important that people realize how, how weird a job this is that I have. Like, mm -hmm. absolutely. I don't get paid. I don't get paid as a record producer by a record label until the final contract is signed, not just by me, but by the recording artist or the recording band. So quite often, all that stuff's really slow to happen, but people, it's like, oh, we all trust each other. We know each other, or we know each other well enough. Like no one's going to screw anybody over. So we go into the studio. Quite often, I've made an entire album without a contract, but there's still, the lawyers are still dotting every I and crossing every because they get paid, paid by the letter. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> And by the time that the contract is done, then they have to get me to sign it, which isn't hard. And then they have to track down the artist who's probably already in, you know, Thailand yeah. promoting the album right. or mm -hmm. like some Mars, you know, hard to reach. And it's easier now with things like DocuSign and where you can, you can sign things virtually. But that was really only used until it's only been used in my experience in the last couple of years. And mm -hmm. everyone else wanted like paper signatures, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. pen to paper. Mm -hmm. So... If four projects are in that state, that means I haven't been paid sometimes in like over a year, you know? And and a few times, it's at one point, I think I had like seven or eight projects that were in that state and I had to just chase people like, please sign the contract so you can release the funds because I can't pay my electrical bill. Yeah. Um, and so I, I've run out of money many times as a grown man doing this, yeah. you know, knowing that there was money coming to me most of the time. But uh, but my outgoing's the same, and you know I don't know. That's not what you asked me. What was your original questions? I'm so sorry. No, that's great. No, that that's good for people to know. People need to know that to know that it's even a struggle for somebody that we perceive to be extremely successful 
at this craft. There's an amazing Pensados place. Uh, you know, I love those guys. Dave oh, yeah. Pensado mm-hmm. and Herb Trowick. Yeah. And I didn't mean to leave Dave out in my talk about people providing great content. Yeah. I mean, what they built is really incredible. And so yeah. I've been on the show a few times. And the last time I was on, I was in one of those things where, you know, my monthly outgoing is basically the same every month, mm-hmm. but my income is not. And I had a big American Express bill that had not been paid on time. And they froze my card and I went and I couldn't buy, I didn't have another credit card at the time, which was stupid. I should, now I have a backup credit card, but I couldn't <laughs> buy anything through that whole long weekend for my family, you know? Wow. Um, and, and, you know, I, I, I had just produced the greatest showman soundtrack, which was the biggest album around the world by far in 2018. It outsold everybody by at least double. And I couldn't, I coun't like buy a tube of toothpaste. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I actually wind up talking about that on the show, you know, yeah. like I'm sitting here, I'm like, you know, a million years old and yes, we can read my Wikipedia entry and it looks really impressive, but I, my credit card's frozen right now because we didn't pay it on time. And, and there's a reason why, because I didn't have the cash to pay it because I'm waiting on the labels to blah, blah, blah. Right. It's, it's you know, it's yeah. crazy. I, of course I could be smarter with my money. I could live, I don't have to own 40 guitars. Like I could, there's things that I could do to peel back, but I don't, I don't, I don't know how else to do it any other way. I yeah. really don't. Yeah. I have no idea how else to approach it other than the crazy way I'm doing it. I don't know what 40 guitars you have, but it's very possible that you have to have all of them. I feel like I have to have most of them. Yeah. <laughs> and not just one snare drum, a few snare drums. At one point I had 12 drum kits. Wow. And I think I'm down to maybe five. Cool. Now. And we were talking about kind of the acoustics of the room and the gear of the room and all that. And the way I relate it to re- relate to it, and the first time I understood why that's a problem where the track sounds bad in the car or something like that is is just wavelength. You know, every note is related to a frequency and related to a wavelength. Mm-hmm. And that sound needs to finish that one cycle to be heard, you know, preferably more than one cycle to be heard. And if your room is small, um, say 13 by 13 bedroom kind of thing or or larger, you know, the 80 hertz sound wave is for 14.5 feet. So it doesn't develop in that room um, for you to hear, you know, and just builds yeah, and up. 80 hertz is not, 80 hertz is not as low a note as you think it is. Right. Right. You know, it's yep. actually like, you know, like fifth, like a lot of kick drum stuff lives around 50 hertz, mm-hmm. which is way lower than 80 hertz. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that stuff that really doesn't stand a fighting chance in a room like that. Right. So if you play the track, you may find that it sounds decent until a minute later, it sounds like you have too much low end or too much 80 Hertz. And then you're pulling that back because it's building up in the space. And meanwhile, you know, your shortest wavelength or shorter wavelength, or maybe a foot, and you're hearing those very clearly out of the speaker. So that's where the confusion goes and where the physics and the feel of the room is important from a mixing standpoint. Anyway, it's as important as the sound of the speakers. It's as important as the quality of the song you're working on. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, you know, are you like just stand in the shower, what any shower that you're in, and just hum, like hum an octave, just go, I can't really sing, but like, mm, just go up an octave. And at some point, you will hear at least one of those notes become incredibly louder than the other yeah. notes. You know, yeah. and I'm fascinated by that stuff. Oh, yeah. yeah. My shower has two different notes it's like an <laughs> F and a G right next to each other, <laughs> just a whole tone apart. They're so loud. And if we talk in there, uh, it sounds so weird because those two frequencies are just cranked. Mm -hmm. Um, Something about the shape of that room. You know, I remember I had a, again, back to boredom, but I was in early high school and we had a stairway that I'm sure is still there. And it went from the ground floor of the school and it went up to kind of like a little, what do you call it when it's like, it goes up and then there's a little platform then it goes up again and then you're on the the second level. Mm -hmm. I've learned that if you stood, if I stood on that little intermediary platform thing in one corner of it, facing the stairs Mm -hmm. up and down, and if I hummed a note that was somewhere between a B flat and a B, somewhere in there, Mm -hmm. that pitch, that octave, the whole thing sounded like the walls were going to fall down. It got so loud. It was like this big, like, Mm -hmm. pipe organ note. And if I got just a half step away from it, onto an A or up to a C or something, it just sounded like I was standing there going, mm. but if I hit that one note, it just, it was crazy. It got so full and loud. Really? And I was not being loud. So 
every room has at least one bizarre tone to yeah. it. Mm-hmm. And, and quite often, and you guys probably know a lot more about this than I do, but quite often there's like tons of weird stuff happening. And sure. then the reverse can happen too, where certain notes, frequencies are too quiet. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and there's big gaps missing of yep. information that won't be missing when you play it in your car, that won't be missing when you sit in front of a record label executive and they're playing it on mm-hmm. their stereo and, and you know, you're going to hear all this stuff that you never heard before. That, mm-hmm. that is more than anything why I decided to get so serious about my listening experience in the studio because I had so many meetings where I would really confidently go in and play something. Like, I mean, talking about really embarrassing stuff, like where you just want to draw a manhole in the street and jump in and never come out again. <laughs> yeah. you know? Like sending it to very powerful people in the music business. And I hadn't checked the mix somewhere else. And I just thought, oh, that's great. I'm going to send this in. And it was disastrous, you know, because I keep the lights on by the way the music sounds, the music I work on. That's how I get repeat work. That's how I get any work. It's what my entire reputation is, is really built on. And um, if I'm sending out, you know, food that doesn't taste good, I'm not going to get people to come pay to eat in my restaurant. So I just really tried everything and went through all these different speakers and took room tuning quite seriously. Mm -hmm. And it's been a process and it's always a process. And I'm almost done building a new studio right now that we've been working on for quite a long time. You know, I'm sure I'm going to get into that then. Like, we've got stuff in place where my fingers are crossed that the way that we've built the control room uh, is going to work. But I won't know till I hear something, you know? Mm-hmm. You know, and actually, I have there's a second room where I'm going to put drums, and it's way, 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 way too live. And uh, I'm going to bug you guys about, uh, you know, what what I, what Orlex stuff I should get to just kind of, like, tamper that room. Absolutely. Good. Yeah, let's work on that. Tame it. the room. Um because it's it's a beautiful live thing. I don't want to kill the live thing. Right. No. Nope. But right now it's it's almost like a cave. It's like too much. <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. You know. You can do you can do like a reverb time on a large space that will tell you what the RT of that room is, based around mm. the surface materials, the geometry, and the size. So, you know, when sound hits a surface, it does a measure of three things: it absorbs, transmits through, or reflects. And every mm-hmm. surface does a different measure of that. You know, like in that conversation of the the stairway you're talking about, if that's around 230 hertz, I know what that is. It's just a very reactive surface to that frequency. Um, when we do large rooms like halls or churches or or commercial spaces where they play music, and if there's a lot of brick or stone or concrete in the room on more than one surface, the walls and or the floor, uh, you'll just get a huge spike at 230 hertz. 230 wow. to, to 125. Uh, just a massive spike where 500 hertz and 1K will be way down here at like three seconds. And then the those 250 and 125 will be six seconds or more. Wow. Fascinating. Physics. It's all physics. Yeah. But interesting stuff. And as important as, you know, the frequency response of your microphone and speakers is the response of your room, right? It all, it's, yeah, unless you're, unless you're working in headphones, which works for some people. It's never worked for me. I've got to hear music coming through speakers. I feel like I'm watching a live performance in front of me. Right. You know, I understand like using headphones to check for things, which I never do, but the room has got to be, at least the room's got to sound great when you sit in your chair, Mm -hmm. when you're mixing. Like maybe it's a, it's a, maybe it's a tall order to have it also sound great. Like in the back corner of the room when it also sounds great here, but I'm sure there's a way to do that too. But at least it's, again, it's down to trust, and I just have to feel like I'm leaving the studio with a thing that I can play for anybody, mm-hmm. for the artist, for the CEO of their record label, for my kids. It's like anyone that I want to impress and, and, and have really like it, it's got to sound like it sounds here. Otherwise, what on earth am I doing? Like, I don't go out and tour this stuff. I, I'm, you know, no one's touring right now, but soon they will be, and certainly they have been before the pandemic. They have to go live on a bus or a van or airplanes and promote this stuff and believe in it and get on stage and feel invested in it. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't work unless they do feel all those things. Yeah. It doesn't right. work unless they feel like they're proud to have their name stamped on it. Really, uh, more than anything, out of respect for all of that, that they're going to be on camera and in front of audiences that have bought tickets, like, I got to give them something that's bulletproof, mm-hmm. you know, and even beyond bulletproof, I feel like we're sort of building little rocket ships to go up into space mm-hmm. and I'm putting the artist in those rocket ships. Like I, you know, I want them to arrive, not just alive, but like happy. Right. 
Um, and that's kind of how I feel about the music that that I work on. It's got to be able to survive yeah. the radiation yeah. of space. <laughs> yeah, you know, and making, writing, producing, recording music all seems really easy until you start doing it, and then you realize it's just some things that I realize about vocals. You probably I think I hear this is that you you can hear everything in a voice when when you sing everything, whether it's the intention of the song, whether the intention of the performance, whether they had a bad day today, where it's not a good day, there's stuff on your mind, you're not in that space yet. Everything to a voice not sure of itself and holding back, like that's a really hard thing to do is just break wide open. It's like, you know, if you're watching a movie and, and you realize that the actor's aware of the camera, Yeah. do you feel like watching the rest of the movie at that point? Probably not. Or if you're watching a live performance and you can tell someone's being self-conscious and they're trying to impress someone in the crowd like i want to see people that are you know frothing at the mouth with their eyes closed maybe even back turned to the audience performing in front of me and that creates a vacuum that draws me in mm -hmm. i want to see an actor on camera being you know just totally committed to the belief of whatever role they're playing whatever is in the script the screenplay and uh, then i follow that you mm -hmm. know and i don't question it because there's no I don't see the seams in it. There's no cracks mm -hmm. in it. It's just, it's totally believable. And I need the music to be very, to inspire confidence. Like I was saying yeah. earlier, it's yeah. got to, it's got to sound inspired, but I also really want people to just feel like this is a house that's not going to fall over. Yeah. Right. And yes, you're absolutely right. If the vocal isn't, the vocal is really the house that shouldn't fall over mm -hmm. because, um, I mean, I'm at the point I've just worked with so many singers as an accompanist. I feel like if I if I have a talent, that's really probably it is being an accompanist, mm -hmm. and then everything sort of stems from that that I do because mm -hmm. I'm sunk without a great singer and a great storyteller. So I really dialed into like what's coming at me from the singer. I was going to say I feel like I'm at the point where we're doing vocal takes where I can tell if if they're not really if they're thinking about something else. Mm -hmm. I will gently say at the end of the take like. I almost feel like you were maybe thinking about something else and they always say, I was, you're right. <laughs> like, it's just, it, the food tastes different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it smells different. Mm -hmm. it sounds, if the energy coming out of the speakers, there's a different energy. Mm -hmm. It feels more like a, like autopilot. Rehearsing and, and learning your craft and playing an instrument or playing or singing and working on that, all that stuff is really important. But that final piece is that, right? Whether you're playing an instrument or singing, it's that honesty, it's that real intent um, and approach. You know what I liken it to is um, it's exactly what the three of us are doing right now. Like we learned at some point in our lives early on how to communicate through this language, right? Mm -hmm. We're all speaking English. Mm -hmm. If we were all born in different countries, we'd be speaking whatever language that was. You know, you get to the point where with language, I have no idea what I'm going to say in five seconds from now. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm sure we're going to be on topic kind of talking about the things we've been talking about. But other than that, I don't really know what you or I am going to say. But I just feel a thing and I can express it through the tools that I have in my toolbox that I don't even think about reaching for those tools anymore because the toolbox has kind of disappeared. It's like it's in us now. It's in our bone marrow. We, we, we eat it for breakfast. We breathe it in and out. We can express ourselves. To get really great at anything, you have to get it to that point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You have to get it to that point where you're not thinking about anything technical when you're actually trying to communicate a thing. Mm -hmm. right? Now... When you're not and you're trying to write or you're trying to like hone a thing or sculpt or whatever it is, absolutely be, you know, look, get your toolbox out mm -hmm. and, and, and attack the statue with all your tools. Mm -hmm. But, but when it's time, like you, you have to sort of be completely unaware. There's this great scene in this uh, movie about the chess player, Bobby Fisher, where he's, he's younger and he's playing his teacher and he gets a bit stuck and, and the teacher takes his arm and just clears the chessboard, knocks all the pieces off, and then says to Bobby, like, there, can you see, is it clear now? Can you see it now? And they finish the rest of the game with nothing on the board. Yeah. You know, and they're just like, they can see it in their brain. Mm -hmm. uh, that happened a lot in the Queen's Gambit, too, mm -hmm. that incredible TV uh, yeah. series yeah. that was just on recently. Yeah. yeah. I think you have to do that with music. I think you have to do that with, with hockey. If you're a hockey player, you got to do it as a, whatever you're doing. You know, if you, if you hope to get it to a level of master, you have to be crazy enough to not quit. You have to be crazy enough to do it hundreds and thousands of times, not very well, and then try to pay attention to what worked and what didn't work and what you'd like to tweak and improve next time. Yeah. And, and you might forget to tweak and improve it next time or the next 20 times, but very slowly, I'm just speaking from myself like i very slowly there's been little things that i've kind of like tried to turn up or turn down in me or my approach and things that worked and reflecting on it thinking about it and and that stuff will lead to a vocal like you're describing in a good way you know another lesson i've learned the hard way is if the vocal 
is totally believable and sounds inspired and sounds plugged into the emotion of the story that's being told, whether it's really happy and party, joyful, or if it's really sad or angry. It has to sound and feel authentic and believable. And then when you get that recorded and sounding right coming through the speakers, for some reason, maybe the reason's obvious, but everything sounds better. The drums sound better. The, the whole mix sounds better. You sound like a better producer. The, the songwriters are better songwriters. Everything has this buoyancy and this sort of oil in the machinery that doesn't happen without that super key ingredient. Right. It's crazy how the right vocal affects everything else underneath it. It's, it is the most important instrument in the entire on the entire record. If you've got a singer, that the vocal is the most important instrument. And if the singer is off... I remember reading one of very few interviews that exists with Mutt Lang. The great, great, great right. producer, Mutt yeah. Lang. And he was talking about how he always thought it was stupid that the vocals typically in a recording, like if you're making a record, most people, and the people still do it, they would have the drummer and the bass player play all their parts for a couple of weeks, track it that way. And I've done this myself. Mm -hmm. And then they bring in the guitar player and they do a week of guitars, put all the guitars down. And then they bring in the keyboard player and do that. And they bring in whatever else. The vocals were always the last thing. Mm -hmm. And he thought that was so silly because because everything else is accompaniment to the lead vocal. Yeah, right? and nobody and played to it. how do you it. know? <laughs> like you've totally you painted into a corner at that point. You've spent, spent all the money, you know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, now it's time to cut the vocal and it better be right and cross your fingers and then we'll mix it and we're done. And he said, once I realized we didn't need to do it that way, the very first thing he does is cut the lead vocal, like the final lead vocal. That's the first thing he chases. And he'll just do it over really kind of demo sounding drums. Nothing that sounds like his final drum track and maybe a guitar, just enough for the singer to sing to. And and, and crazily enough, the last thing he does uh, are the drums. Pretty sure, and I might have made up part of this answer because I read it so long ago, but I'm pretty sure he said something like, he never really knows what the drums are going to need to sound like by the time the rest of the track is done. You know, and how many times have we all been in the studio, recorded a drummer, mm -hmm. right. the drums sound awesome. Mm -hmm. By the time you get that track to the finish line and everything's on it, the drums don't sound good, as good anymore. <laughs> mm -hmm. And everyone's kind of like, well, what's the problem? Yeah. What happened? Those drums sounded so good. Well, they did sound good by themselves, mm -hmm. but the minute you introduce other yeah. sound, mm -hmm. it affects what right. you have, right. you know? I mean, you know this, you're like, you know, measuring frequencies in rooms. Mm -hmm. It's like one thing affects the other. Yeah. I'm starting to work in movies now. And, uh, you know, I started out in my first movie saying, why can't you just use my mixes? Why do you, why do I need to break up my mixes into stems and give it to you? Why don't you just use my mix? Because that is how I want it to sound. The Oscar winning Paul Massey <laughs> on Greatest Showman, he very gently said, well, Greg, I understand what you're saying. But he said, the minute you come to the, to the, to the film mixing stage, they call it the dub stage, you'll understand why I need more control yeah, over absolutely. it. Because your mix will sound great if I just play it and nothing else is playing. Mm -hmm. That's right. But he said, the minute there's any sound over top of it, like the sound of soft wind, mm -hmm. yeah. Dialogue, yeah. a pigeon, mm -hmm. a coin drop, anything, anything of footsteps. If there's footsteps and we got to hear the footsteps because they're on camera and you see the, the mm -hmm. footsteps happening, then all of a sudden your kick drum sounds really thin. Mm -hmm. yep. And I, he's like, I haven't touched your kick drum, but that's what you gave me. And he said, I need to be able to get in there and either turn up the kick drum or add low end to it. So it competes with the thing that's robbing the bandwidth of that thing. Um, Sorry, I'm talking about a lot of stuff. That's fantastic. No, that's, that's, that's a huge, that's a huge thing too. I, and I, that it brings me to another quick question. Are you, are you, you mentioned you're doing more film work? Are you getting to getting into doing some more film scoring and that kind of thing? Uh, you would think that I'd be looking at film scoring, but, mm -hmm. but actually what I'm, the things I've been busy with, like most of the last 13 months have been spent working on two different movies as a mixer and uh, doing some production work on it as well. Greatest Showman sort of blew open a door that I didn't even know was there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've worked on four films now and about to start my fifth in a couple months. And and they're all musicals. And I like I don't even really like musicals. You know, that's what my <laughs> mom used to listen to and used to just make my make my skin just like <laughs> it's not my thing, you know? Mm -hmm. But uh <laughs> But actually, I've come to really like like the modern musical, the mm -hmm. kind of taking this very sort of like kind of hokey, wonderfully nostalgic format and and make it kind of very current and and right. even edgy, you know, like how Lin Manuel Miranda did Hamilton and really everything Lin's done. And Lin is one of the people that I'm working with on awesome. uh, these two last films. Okay. I did their his stuff and Alex Lacamoire and Bill Sherman, who 
have worked with Lynn for years and we're, we're all about to work on a, a third film together uh, this summer. Um, wow. And it's fascinating stuff, but it's really like, you know, it's, it, it, it's, it's like this amazing extension of all the stuff I've kind of already kind of been aware of and, and kind of trying to get my head around and trying to get good at. Film is, um, is so uh, macro compared to making a three and a half minute song in a studio with one or two other people. It's, it's, it's such an army of people. There's so many cooks in the kitchen. And really, even though there can be like over 100 people on a film set when you're making the movie, the kitchen is actually kind of tiny. Yeah. And uh, but there's still a lot of cooks in it, and, right. and I have to figure out a way to where I can still trust my own instinct right. mm -hmm. and present that in a way that doesn't piss anybody off. Because I'm not trying to do that. I'm just trying to make the music as great as I think it could be. Mm -hmm. Right. And I'm watching people who who do this all the time, and watching how good they are at talking to other people. Mm -hmm. They're really like like people like Paul Massey, or I just worked with uh, the incredible Gary Rizzo, who oh, mixes wow. all the Christopher Nolan films. Awesome mix. And um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's awesome. All these guys are like amazing. You know, yeah. Alan Myerson, um, yep. it's unbelievable. And they really understand people chops. That's they, a big one. They really absolutely. understand how absolutely. to. It's huge, especially <laughs> on a movie because movies are more expensive to make than records. So there's a lot more riding on them. When you're, you're sitting on a project that is, you know, they're spending tens and tens and tens of millions of dollars on it. And that's just to make the movie. And then it costs at least that much again to promote it. Right. I, exactly. I think I heard it costs twice as much to promote a movie as it does to make really? it. Really? Pretty much. Yeah. So you can't, you just, there's no room for an idiot in those things, unless the idiot is in charge. If the idiot is the director, <laughs> then you're kind of stuck. Um, you, you say that as though there's yeah. record of that happening. <laughs> oh, there's time to record that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Once with me, once with me and, uh, and then, you know, there's lots of stories yeah, about that. Yeah, yeah. The director is really God on a, on a film. Yep. And if the director's cool, you're going to have a great experience. Uh, if the director's not cool, it's everyone's tortured until it's done. And I had that happen once. I'll, you know, I'll never, ever work if that person calls me again. Never work with them. <laughs> uh, life's too short. <laughs> but yes, people chops is like, is as important to me as making sure that your room sounds right. Huge. You know? Yeah. Or that the music sounds right. Yeah. It's, it's because this is a people business. It's all word of mouth. Yeah. Yep. It still is in 2021. It's word of mouth. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, and, and, that, and that's, that's the currency that we're trading. So it's really important to be able to say what you feel. Don't be fake. Don't be phony. Be yourself. Mm -hmm. But it's a professional situation. You know, it's not some like delayed adolescence where we're all hanging out at a party and, you know, there's money involved, there's careers involved. I have to remind myself that like whoever walks through the door of my studio you know, whatever we decide to do that day could wind up potentially, you know, changing a lot of lives, potentially being worth millions of dollars for the artist and the record company. You know, I had a thing happen. I've never talked about this before, but uh, I've worked a lot with Katy Perry over the years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's two songs that she tried to start with me that for various reasons we didn't finish and she wound up finishing them with other people at a different time. Uh, one was I Kissed a Girl, her first massive single. Wow. Yeah. that broke her career wide open. And the other one was my favorite single of hers ever called Firework, um, which is a great, great song. It was a huge hit. She tried to start writing that with me. And for whatever reason, we just didn't catch a wave of inspiration and it just sort of died on the vine. And she took it to uh, my friends, these great producers, Stargate, many months later and wrote it with them. You know, I have like, I kind of kick myself going like, why didn't I realize literally any idea? I mean, I knew there was, but it was like worth... Like, who cares if I don't feel inspired? Like, just pour a little more water on the plant because mm -hmm. you never know mm -hmm. how Katie's sitting there with her notebook throwing out ideas. Like, yeah, maybe it's a song that no one will ever hear. I've written those songs with her too. Mm -hmm. But it could be one of the biggest hit singles mm -hmm. in the history of radio. You know? yeah. yeah, right. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, now, uh, you just don't know. Now, July 4th has a holiday song, you know. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, she sang it on the, uh, uh, when Biden won the presidency, she yeah. was in Washington and mm -hmm. they you know, had an insane fireworks display yeah. that night and it was live on TV and there she is singing firework. Yeah. Like it was incredible. I was kind of going that maybe that could have been my song too, but oh, well, whatever. It's <laughs> yeah. a nice problem, yeah. but, but it's good for all of us to remember. Like you just don't know how one thing leads to the next. Right. And, Absolutely. And, uh, having right. good people chops and trying to be professional about it just never makes it worse. It always makes it better. Absolutely. That's great advice. So here we go to the end question. This is the toughest question that we have. These have all been softball questions. I mean, just lobbing 
softball questions to you. Here comes the hard, Uh-oh. the hardball, ninety mile an hour Uh-oh. question down the center of the plate. Is there something that's interesting or unexpected about you that people don't know that we haven't talked about about Greg Wells outside of the music world or production world, hobbies, interests, or activities uh, that you could share? Um, taxidermy? No, that's a joke. Um, that's a good one though. <laughs> I feel like we've already had that answer though. <laughs> uh, I don't know how interesting it is. I mean, I, you know, growing up in the church, it was a thing I was born into. And then at some point, I remember like around nine or 10, just sort of, I had some questions about certain things that didn't make sense to me. And I talked to my dad about it and he was super cool about it. He was actually very open-minded and very left of center. And and the older he got, became even more left of center. Typically people go the other way, the older they mm-hmm. get. But he has this very sort of progressive view on on a lot of stuff, and and so I would just poke holes in religion all the time with him, and like want his feedback, and 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 he would you know always say like you're right, I can't really argue with that. Yes, the church is filled with hypocrisy mm-hmm. and hypocrites, and uh and and yes, that's like you know shooting fish in a barrel. Like yes, it's easy to point that out. Okay, I agree. But if you really are concerned about it, like you know join hands with it and try to improve it, try to make it better. And he said that's what he was trying to do. Um, and, and the church, by the way, in the church's defense, it does do a lot of amazing stuff locally and around the world that no one ever writes about because it's boring press, mm-hmm. but amazing, amazing charitable stuff where people aren't siphoning off the top mm-hmm. and the money really does go straight to the people that need it. Um, so I'm not, I'm not kicking church to the curb, you know, look, right. everything, me included has all kinds of things that you could like, you know, point to and go, well, that's messed up. Mm-hmm. <laughs> But, you know, everything has a good and a bad side to it. So, mm-hmm. but it it sort of started this um, philosophical pursuit for me. And I, I started having a lot of ideas about like, well, what's important in life and what really works and what what's inspiring and what sort of creates an interesting piece of art or creates interesting school of thought or, uh, and then discovered philosophy as an elective course in my first year of college. And they were talking, uh, the teacher was talking about Socrates and Plato. And I naively put my hand up and I just said, this is blowing me away. Like I've had a lot of these same thoughts myself. And the teacher kind of looked at me like, okay, you know, <laughs> thanks for that. Next. But I, I had, you know, it really, it really resonated. I was like, these are things I used to think about lying in bed sick, yeah. you know, in, mm-hmm. in Peterborough. And uh, not as eloquently, of course, as uh, how Plato wrote about Socrates and, and, and I just went down this Socrates rabbit hole for a couple of years and took all that in and then discovered all kinds of other philosophers. And, you know, I'm, it, I mean, I don't know what it is as humans, like we're all very capable. It's our, like our frontal lobe, you know, we have this desire for analysis and meaning and like, why are we here? And what does this mean? And it's why a lot of people turn to religion because it, it does explain right. a lot of the unexplainable. It puts a label on it. That's comforting. You know, I get it. Like I, mm-hmm. we all want to, we all want an answer. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think maybe had I not grown up in the church and had the luxury of, of rebelling against it, you know, I don't go to church now. I still feel spiritual and I'm, I'm, I'm up for anything that's a good idea. Mm-hmm. I, I'm fascinated and humbled by everything from science to religious uh, lessons. You know, I mean, the stuff that Jesus talked about is still today completely, right. completely revolutionary. Right. 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 You like, can't argue you know, that it's it, good it, advice and lessons, right? You can't argue with that at all. Cannot argue with that at all, yeah. you know? And there's a lot of stuff that, that a lot of people appeared around 2,000 years ago, from Confucius to Jesus to, I'm forgetting everybody else, but I think Siddhartha, or also around the same period, you know, Muhammad was like, what, mm-hmm. four, 500 years later? Like, there's a real sort of, Socrates was right around then too, give or take a few hundred years, I think. Um there was a real sort of like peak in kind of humanity's sort of take on like, what is all of this mm-hmm. and why are we here? Mm-hmm. And I love all that stuff. And I, you know, like a modern day philosopher like Joseph Campbell, he wrote that incredible mm-hmm. book, The Hero Has a Thousand Faces, and just mm-hmm. how we're all like fish hook in the face, mm-hmm. wanting to have a hero in our lives, right. Right? you know, or more than one. And we love it in movies and stories and yeah. books and mm-hmm music it's all mythology it's like we all well, that's why mythology works so well and mythology really was the religion at one point you know at one point people do believe zeus was real mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and that poseidon was real and that was the religion of the time and pro- you know christopher hitchens said at some point way off in the future any religion that's current today m- will probably be considered as mythology in the same way that we consider greek or roman mythology wow. right. as mythology and not as wow. a religion but who knows and who cares because it's all storytelling 
like Jesus used to tell parables mm -hmm. to really like hammer home a point. He would always use metaphor and parables mm -hmm. and it's so powerful. And of course, having that be in a song, right? like, you know, a parable or a story set to music with a really great melody and a really great music feel, whatever, whatever it is, fast, slow, great, funky drums, no drums. Mm -hmm. That's like, that's an amazing thing. Mm -hmm. And so that stuff fascinates me on a level that doesn't involve music, mm -hmm. like uh, any sort of philosophical writing. And I just want to, before we sign off, I want to share with you something that, again, is more inspiration than any of us need to make sure that the music sounds right from the, the music that you're creating to the way it comes out of your speakers to the way that it travels from your speakers to your ears in the room you're working in. When my two oldest kids were quite young, I and uh, their mom, my ex-wife Louise, we were on uh, a vacation on the west coast of Canada and we were staying in a bed and breakfast. You know, it's like a, like a big house with mm -hmm. some rooms and everyone kind of shares the big breakfast table in the morning. So we were there, Louise and I were there with our two boys and there was another family that was there and they were kind of around the same age as us and similar age kids. And as can happen in a situation like that, I kind of got talking with the dad and he at some point asked me like, well, what do you do for a living? And I said, well, I'm a musician and I'm, you know, work on making songs and making records. And I don't really like talking about what I do, mm -hmm. uh, especially with strangers, but I just sort of gave some like things, you know, I'm in music professionally. And I said, well, do you mind me asking what you do? Because uh, we'd had a really nice conversation up to this mm -hmm. point. And, and he sort of looked away and really deflected. And he just kind of quietly said, I'm, uh, he looked at his kids. He said, I'm in communications. And then he just turned away. His body language is like, we're going to shut down that conversation. Wow. And it worked. And it was really effective. And then I was just, after maybe 30 seconds, I thought, you can't get away with that. Like, I just, you know, why, <laughs> what does that mean? Right. Yeah. So I said, uh, do you mind me asking you, uh, what do you mean? Like, are you, are you an English teacher? Are you communications? Or what, are you in newspapers? And. And then he started talking and he didn't say, well, I do this. He didn't say anything like that, but he started talking about the world. And then after that, he sort of slipped in, you know, it used to be really easy to listen to Al Qaeda pre 9-11. We could intercept all their stuff. And after 9-11, it all went quiet. We have no idea how they're communicating with each other. And so he was telling me he's in intelligence. Right. Wow. And, you know, intercepting stuff. Right. And, and he said... I, you know, and he just, he kind of, it was really kind of amazing. It's like a scene from a movie, the way he rolled it out to yeah. me. He didn't admit anything, but he told me everything. Right. <laughs> right. He said, I want you to know that we in the intelligence community are really in awe and we can't understand, but we sure know the power of it, how a great song can travel across lines of, on the map, yeah, across different ideologies, across yeah. thousands of years of hatred between two different mm -hmm warring factions that you know total like sworn enemies can be dancing to the same song and mm -hmm. loving the same song in the same way and he said we have been trying to decode what that is for the longest time because we would love to you know we're basically spreading a message of like let's let's just stop killing each other right. and let's like get along right. and he said of course that as you might imagine that leads to a lot of not very good songs right. but he said <laughs> don't don't ever forget the power that you have when you get a great song, it's really like this flaming ball of fire that is unstoppable and gets into yeah. everybody's lives. Uh, and I never, ever thought of it that way incredible? before, but there's really, it's incredible. It's really incredible how it, you know, putting a great story, something true, yeah. something authentic to setting it to music, the great melody, like what is melody? You know, I don't know. I find the greatest songs just sort of like appear, yeah. just kind of like plop out of people. But it was fascinating to have him frame it that mm -hmm. way. I never, yeah. I've never sort of, you know, it did help me kind of like take it a little more seriously. Not that I wasn't taking it seriously, but yeah. just to have his very, very, very objective take on it from a, coming from a totally different profession mm -hmm. and just looking at the effectiveness of the communication of it when you get it right. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, wow. It's incredible. Yeah. That's very powerful. I mean, that's the whole, that is what music eventually is to everyone. It's a way to connect everyone yeah, around the totally. world regardless I, of what your beliefs are yeah. where you're from anything like that. so, that's yeah. right yeah yeah it, it, it erases all of that stuff yeah. greg i think i could do this all day if not do it again i suggest that we do a series the world according to greg wells <laughs> this is episode one. Oh no <laughs> <laughs> that would be wow. really cool that would be really, um, really cool. or some other title you know we're in we're it's work in progress right now Thank you. I've loved speaking with both of you. I'm glad we're doing this. Yeah, me oh, too. Thank you. Thanks thank you so us. much for your time. Thank you, guys. Thanks for everything.
Thanks again for listening to Creative Spaces. And before we go, please make sure you head over to Orlex.com where you'll find a ton of information to make the right choices when it comes to acoustical treatment and sound isolation for your creative space. You can also purchase Orlex products on our site or your favorite Orlex dealer. And follow Orlex on your social media platform of choice. Thanks for listening.